Reporting to you live from Paris, France, where Victor Wimbenyama had a big 19-point performance, I would give you my thoughts after spending five days in Paris and watching Wimbenyama play twice. I'll give you my thoughts on Victor Wimbenyama. And then I have a few other international prospects or internationally born prospects that I think could have a big impact on the 2023 NBA draft. Stay tuned. Happy Friday. I know this episode is a little late. I wanted to wait until I watched uh, another Victor Wimbayama game before I posted this episode. But once again, shout out to each and every person that has made the Locked On NBA Big Boys your first listen of the day. And this episode is brought to you by Bet Online because Bet Online has you covered this season with more props, odds, and lines than ever before. That's because Bet Online is where the game starts. All right, you are listening. Well, I'm sure you know, but you are listening to the Locked On NBA Big Board Podcast, which is your daily NBA draft podcast. I am Rafael Barlow, the director of scouting for NBA Big Board and the founder of NBA Draft Junkies. And I am a tired, tired man. My last five days, let's see, it is Friday. It is 12.47 a.m., so I guess technically it is Saturday. But it is. I got here Monday. I spent Monday night and Tuesday in Paris, also Wednesday in Paris. Thursday, I went to Amsterdam. I took a bus, a six-hour bus ride to Amsterdam. Went to watch some some prospects. I know the Netherlands or the Netherlands or Holland is is not a hotbed for prospects, but I hear there are some some really talented players there. And what I did not know was the Netherlands. <laughs> is one of the tallest countries in the world. And so they basically feel like they have the talent there. It's just basketball is not a big deal. So I went there to observe a few workouts and see some of the um, Dutch prospects. And then this morning I took the bus back, six hours and 45 minutes, got back to Paris, had enough time to grab some things. Because now that I'm married, you know, out of town, I got to bring something home for my wife and the baby. <laughs> Grabbed a few things changed clothes and then I went to the game tonight where Victor Wimbayama posted 19 points it was like 19 points six rebounds I thought he played well uh, three assists two blocks two steals knocked down two three-pointers and I thought like it was a performance that really showcased his strengths and some of the the concerns that people have but at this point I feel like we've never seen anything like him We've never seen anything like that, like like him, I should say. And I think at this point, people are starting to nitpick, which happens all the time. You know, it happened with it happens with every prospect. You know, I can go back to 2018. People just nitpicked Luka Doncic. To I mean, I mean, it's he's too slow. He's this or that. Every little flaw, and um, people just had reasons to to have some doubts. And so I'm starting to see that a little bit with, with Wimbayama. And this game was cool because I actually had courtside seats. Last game, I was second row. This game, uh, crazy story. And uh, I know you, you want to get to the details about the game, but sometimes I just want to mix in some of my crazy stories. So I get to the game early, and uh, I see a seat for me, and I see two scouts. I won't even mention where they're from. I don't even know if I should do that. But two scouts from teams that I think – well, one team for sure has championship aspirations, and the other team is expected to make the playoffs. But I saw two scouts sitting, and the seat that was saved for me was left. It was open between them. So I just mentioned, hey, you know, I, I imagine the game is going to be packed. Hey, this is my seat. And the scout says, hey, I, I want to sit here. You want to switch with me? I'm like, where are you sitting at? He shows me a seat, front row. So I have front row seats and uh, it, it just kind of made me think, man, how far I've come. I, I remember like having to pay my own way to sit in the nosebleeds to scout just a few years ago. And now I am sitting courtside watching the projected number one pick play. So it just it just definitely made me feel and actually in France. So it made me feel somewhat accomplished and. You know, so everybody that wants to get involved in scouting, this is this is my advice to you. I'm going on a tangent here. 
Put out content. Put out content. I have been able to get to different games and have access to different things because if I say, hey, my name is Rafael Barlow, and yada, 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 all they have to do is Google my name and they're going to find tons and tons of content. So content is key. And then also for the aspiring scouts, you got to get in a gym. I mean, watching film is one thing, but you have to get in the gym to watch these guys. But anyway, let's just talk about Wimbayama. So this game, he showed... You know, the athleticism and the fluidity he had some dunks early. And it's like, I, I keep saying Nerf Rim. If you, if you go to my Twitter, Barlow, B-A-R-L-O-W-E-5-0-0, I have a few clips that I was able to post. I'm not going to post all of them because I see there's such a limited supply of high-quality Wimbayama content that I'm going to save it for myself for a different project. But, yeah, I mean, he it's like he's on a Nerf Rim. I mean, there was a play early in the game. He's running the floor. And even just watching him run the floor and transition from defense to offense is something that that is um, it really stands out to me because he can contest a shot. But he's so agile and fluid that he can contest a shot at the rim and sprint and be the first person down the floor. And he's always going to be like a transition uh, finisher or a threat to run the floor and transition. And his, his first basket, I believe, um, he ran the floor. Tremont Waters, the, the guard from LSU, got him the ball. And it's like he caught it and just effortlessly outside of the paint took off and kind of finished through traffic. And, you know, it's like one of those things where when you watch him on film, now the film that you usually see is pretty grainy anyway. When you watch him on film, you can see, like, the size and the length. But when you see it in person, it is... A totally different perspective like he has like this crazy dunk radius vertically and I guess horizontally that he can just take off from different spots on the floor that we're just not used to seeing people take off from and, and finish with ease so um that was a play that stood out then he had like a tip dunk where it looked like again on the nerf rim barely jumped and he just kind of tapped it down uh defensively I feel like this team did not have the same game plan as the, the game that I saw Tuesday. They really didn't try to go at him too much. There was a play early in the game where they did, and he blocked the shot. I don't know where it went, but he, like, swatted it. Like a dangerous swat. It's like the type of swats that, that you know, of course they look good on highlights, but the ones that you pick up fouls if you don't block the ball completely. And so that's one of the things I think he needs to – kind of watch out for because he does have a tendency to <laughs> hunt highlight blocks you know instead of like keeping the ball in play but it may not be a bad thing because I think sometimes you can't send a message by by blocking somebody's shot into like the fifth row you block their shot in the fifth row they may not come back and so that's what happened in this particular play they ran a post up for the team's other big I mean he swatted this shot like a fly swatter and that was pretty much it and there were so many different plays that won't show up in the highlights where he just altered the dynamics of the driving lanes or or, or guys got to the rim or they looked to turn the corner and then they decided to pass it out so defensively even though he didn't have like a crazy performance as far as like ridiculous amount of blocks I thought defensively he played well. He did go out and contest some threes. That's something that I like seeing from him is that he's not afraid to contest threes. You know, there are some bigs that only want to stand in the paint, especially if they pride themselves on being a really good shot blocker. They usually like to camp around the paint. He, when I, I mean, they actually made two really tough contested threes on him, but he did block a three. And and I'm like I said, I'm sitting courtside, and it was just down on the other end. But it was on the same side of the court that I was on. And just seeing where he took off from and how he was able to block this shot just, I mean, it's just one of those things that we have not seen somebody this long, fluid, and agile in ever, honestly, ever. But overall, again, I give him a, he had a good performance and he knocked down two threes. That was, that was the big thing is he knocked down two threes and like I said, last game. The shot wasn't going in, but I am a believer in his 
potential as a floor spacer. I'm a big believer. The downside of it is sometimes you can tell that he kind of struggles with the physicality. And, I mean, he can't shoot over the top of guys. But if he's at, like, at the mid post or trying to post up, he, he does have uh, a tendency to force a a – you know some shots I think he is trying to prove that he is the best player he is trying to score but overall I mean I, I if I had to give his performance a grade I, I'd give it an a minus just because I um, mean he had a few funny possessions but overall like I said I thought he played well all right when we return I want to talk about a few prospects that are internationally born they weren't born here in the states that I think could have an impact on on the 2023 NBA draft. But before I talk about those prospects, I want to talk to you about Bet Online because Bet Online is your number one source for football betting information this season. You can find all of the latest player developments, team matchups, news, podcasts, and in depth articles and analysis on every game you can find. And as always, BetOnline remains your continued source for all of your sport wagering information with live betting and up-to-the-minute scores for every sport out there. It is the fastest and the easiest way to check on all your favorite games, events, including Major League Baseball, MMA, boxing, and golf. Head to BetOnline.net and use your mobile device to learn more. BetOnline is where the game starts. All right, once again, you are listening to The Locked on NBA Big Board Podcast. I am your host, Rafael Barlow. And let's talk about a few international prospects that I think could have an impact in the 2023 NBA draft. All right, first I want to talk about James Naji. Nanaji. 6'10, born in 2004. If you didn't know, in, in Europe they they classify players by generation. So he was born in 2004. It's not like, you know, there's college ball, so you got junior, senior, freshman, yada, yada, yada. They go by um, the year you were born. So James Naji was born in 2004. I had a chance to watch him play last year uh, when I was on my, my European tour. Played for Barcelona. Mostly spent the at least the beginning of the season playing on their junior team. Great body. And I've, I've talked about him before on podcast from last, um, last fall. Great body. I, I jokingly say, even though he is Nigerian and he's playing in Europe, I called him the European version of Jalen Duran. Very similar as far as, like, just this incredible physical presence that, like, how are you a teenager with this grown man body with muscles on top of muscles. So very similar, uh, maybe not as he doesn't have the same passing upside as, as, as Duran, but as far as just like the, the physicality, great body. He is a guy that is probably going to make a living in the NBA as a rim runner, vertical lap threat, offensive rebounder, just your, Modern day big that doesn't really space the floor, block shots, again, just catches lobs, runs the floor in transition, shoots 65% from the floor because every shot he takes is a, a dump off or a dunk or very close to the rim. Pretty good hands. One of the things that I like about him, and I think it it um it it shows that he's been playing in a, in a system and that he has a pretty decent IQ is that he just knows how to find gaps in the defense. He doesn't just stand still. He's always constantly putting himself in position to be a target where he can get easy dunks. And when I watched him play with the juniors last year, I was just not impressed. I felt like he dominated simply because of his size. And, and I, you know, I wouldn't even say he dominated. I feel like he put up numbers simply because he was just bigger, stronger, and more athletic than everyone else. And especially if you, you think about it, like international juniors, there's not too many guys that are 6'10 and athletic and strong. So he had a, a clear-cut athletic advantage. And I wasn't as high on him until some injuries ended up um, impacting Barcelona's senior team season. And he was kind of forced into a a role where he had to play minutes. And he played really, really well. He actually looked a lot better as a professional against the top EuroLeague and ACB competition than he did 
playing against his own age group. And, you know, it kind of makes sense to me simply because the spacing is better when you're playing with, uh, you know, with the senior team. The point guards are better as far as knowing how to get you the ball on the roller. And he had a very, very simplified role. He wasn't really getting post touches. They weren't feeding him the ball and, and trying to, you know, work on his jump hook. It was basically, hey, we're trying to win this game. Your job is to set the screen, roll, find gaps on the defense, dunk, defend, run the floor. And that's exactly what he did. And so I feel like those performances last last season with the Barcelona Senior Club put him in contention to, to be a first-round pick. Now, the concerns are he's a poor free-throw shooter, lacks touch around the rim, does not have good feel as a back-to-the-basket post player. He does have a tendency to load up on his jumps but it's weird. And when I say load up on his jumps and, you know, the person that comes to mind is Dwight Howard. I used to feel like Dwight left so many points on the board because if you threw him the ball or if he got an offensive rebound, instead of keeping it high, he brought it down to his waist to power up to dunk. And a lot of times because he was so strong, he was able to do it. But then there were times where by the time he brought it down to power up, he got hit with a hard foul, lost the ball, goes to the free throw line where he made one out of two. And so Najee does have a tendency to load up, but it's so fast. He, he does it so fast. And, um, I mean, that's just kind of like a, a a flaw there. But he doesn't space the floor. And in today's NBA, I feel like if you don't space the floor, if you're a big, you have to either space the floor or be an anchor of the defense. And I think that he has a much, 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 much better chance of being a defensive anchor than a floor spacer. But he's young. I mean, he's still, what, 18 years old. So there is a chance that he can develop. But I just right now, I just don't really see him as someone that has great touch around the rim. All right, the next player that I want to talk about is very intriguing. Usman Njai. He's 6'10". He's skilled. He has NBA positional size and length. He is from Senegal. And I watched this film recently, take a you know a, a double look at it. And the things that stood out to me is he's agile, he's coordinated, he can put the ball on the floor, attack closeouts, has these long strides to the rim. I mean, he has a nice looking shot. The mechanics look good. You look at his shot, even if it's not going in, you, you say to yourself, like, with his touch, the arc, and all that, that he is going to be able to be a, a solid floor spacer. But what makes him a little bit different than a lot of African prospects is he does have some wing skills, and, and he's you know has potential as a shooter. He moves off the ball. He can play off pin downs and motion plays. I believe that he has the potential to be this 6'10", dribble, shoot, and pass wing that NBA teams covet. I mean, that's perfect for today's NBA. Teams want versatility, and they want guys that can do multiple things. And right now, he he's more potential than um, performance, but he has the tools. He shows some flashes of being able to create off the dribble. Maybe not like, like crossovers and, and, and dancing to get into the basket, but he does show the ability to where if he has a – he can kind of mix the guy up with his ball handling and then shoot off the dribble, which is very impressive and coveted at, at 6'10". He's a good ball handler. Again, he fits the mode of your modern NBA oversized wing um, or, or four-man. I think his his role is going to be like a pick-and-pop four that can do a little bit more as far as like attacking closeouts. Um Again, upside as a pull-up shooter, he's active on the glass, has pretty good touch. He's competitive. He plays hard. The concerns are with, like, a lot of prospects from Senegal is that he needs to get stronger. He's very – I don't want to say very, but he's physically weak. He definitely needs to get stronger, struggles playing through contact. He's still a little raw offensively, and he needs to, like, improve his feel for the game. He can tighten his handle and improve his handle. Has a tendency to settle for some tough shots, but – that could have been related to his role playing for the Senegal under-18 team. And right now, like I said, the, it's, it's all about potential. He's not a consistent shooter, but the upside and potential is there. If he can be a consistent shooter, then it's going to open up everything else in his game. Then you know he'll need to improve his decision-making. But 
The concern for me is that he's not a really good free throw shooter, despite the fact that he looks like he has good touch and the potential as a three point shooter. So, you know, it's one of the things I've talked about it before. If you are one of the the people that believe that free throw shooting is a good indicator of shooting touch and three point shooting, then that is a big red flag. But overall, I think this kid has a lot of talent. Could be a first round pick. You never know. Could be a guy that's a draft and stash. It just it just depends on what teams are looking for. And it also, of course, depends on what type of season he has. All right. When I return, I have another few prospects that I want to talk about that are internationally born that I think could impact the 2023 NBA draft. Stay tuned. All right, once again, you are listening to the Locked On NBA Big Board Podcast. This is your host, Rafael Barlow. All right, the next prospect that I want to talk about is a guy that I'm high on. And I may be a little bit higher on him than other people. And it is Tristan Vucevic, who played last year at Real Madrid, who is currently on Partizan, which Partizan is a team that is competing in the EuroLeague this year. They're based out of Serbia. And Vucevic is a guy that I went to watch last year. And uh, he played for Real Madrid, or he was on the team, but he was in a role where he just didn't get a lot of minutes. And I had went to watch him play. So my only real evaluation of him was to watch him warm up before the game and shoot. And then the very limited spot minutes that he had. And that's the weird part about European basketball as far as evaluating prospects. There's like this weird age range between 18 through 22, maybe even as high as 24 where guys can just get lost, where you're like too good for the juniors, but then you're good enough to to hold a roster spot on a senior team, but not good enough to really crack the rotation and play a major role. And the reason for that is because there's no incentive to lose in Europe. There's no incentive to give guys developmental minutes. Everything is about winning. Because you can get demoted to a lower level league. I mean, everything is about winning. And there's no NBA draft. And and it's something that I've mentioned a few times before. But a lot of people don't understand. There's no NBA draft in Europe. So, you know, in the NBA, a team like the Thunder, it's in their best interest to develop a raw prospect. Because, you know, if, if he ends up being great and he helps them win that's good if he doesn't then he helps them get a better draft pick and so you see teams that are you know tanking or teams that have a long-term developmental plan we don't really see that in europe so guys between this 18 and 22 range can can get lost in the shuffle especially if they're on a really good team that is looking to compete for like a yearly championship it's, it's hard for them to crack minutes. So with Vucevic, he ends up going to Partizan, which last year was playing in the Euro Cup with the hopes of getting to the Euro League. Now they're in the Euro League. He could end up in the same situation again. But let me give you some information. He is 6'10", 6'11", maybe, um, born in 2003. So he is, uh, what is that, 19, 19 years old. He moves really well. Well, you know, it's, I'll get to that in a second. He he's agile, he's coordinated, he moves well. He's one of these guys that's like weird athletically. Sometimes when you watch him, you're like, oh, he's a really good athlete. And then there's times where you're like, uh, I don't know how he played in the NBA. So he's one of these players that is athletic with a runway. Like if he's in transition. And, or if he's cutting, then you'll see him make a play above the rim and you say he's really athletic. But it's not like that quick pop, explosive, like explodes off the ground. It's, it's not that type of athleticism. And then he's a little straight up. Like he has, <laughs> he has great posture, I, I should say. So I think like his hips are a little tight. So I don't know if he'll be able to like really defend in space. But I still like him. I think that he is a guy that is your your modern day pick and pop big. I think he can make plays as a straight line driver once he gets stronger. He does have broad shoulders. Um, he does have some toughness to him. He has like an inside outside game where I think that he is skilled enough on the block to where he can exploit a mismatch if you put a smaller defender on him. 
and he can also bring like your you know your your rim protector out because I think that he has this pick and pop potential. I think he's a good shooter when his feet are set. He has a beautiful release. It's, it's one of these shots that you're surprised it doesn't go in more than it than it does. But I think that again the potential to be a, a, a pick and pop floor spacer is high. He has a good baseline of skills. He cuts. He's been with some really good coaches and really good programs. And like I said, he can put the ball on the floor. He does have the ability to put the ball on the floor and pull up and elevate over the top of guys. And they run him off of action plays. He He's a capable shooter on the move. So you're like 6'11", he can do all of that. What are the, the downsides? And I'd say he's an inconsistent shooter. Like the shot looks better than the results. He does have a tendency to settle for fadeaways. Like I said, he's a good athlete, but he lacks the lateral quickness, and he's so, his posture is so good. He doesn't really get low, so he's kind of straight up. So he's not really going to beat guys off the dribble one-on-one. So if he does score in the paint, it's either as a, a cutter or maybe he attacked the closeout. And despite his athleticism or, or with a runway, he's not a vertical lob threat because it's not the quick from a standstill shoot up the air catch. Um, again, like I said, he's stiff and upright, and I think that's going to have a impact on him defending in space. But overall, I like him. I think he deserves a shot. The problem is Partizan is now in the EuroLeague, and I think that he's going to be in a situation where he may get squeezed out for minutes because they're probably going to bring in a veteran. Because from what I've heard, and uh, I've heard this from some people to show how different basketball is in Europe, that this team was out of the Euro League um, the last few years, and then they wanted they wanted to get back. They brought in arguably the best coach in um, Joko Obradovic. And then they started making big money moves as far as bringing in players that demand high salaries. So what I've heard is that the government in Serbia is backing this team. They have government money to buy expensive players and so there's a chance that they'll probably bring in you know a, another high profile big because they're trying to win the the euro league which is weird because they didn't win the euro cup last year and if i'm not mistaken they didn't even win the serbian league they got like a at at large bid i mean european basketball is kind of tricky to me so th if i'm not mistaken they ended up not playing in the finals of the Serbian League Championships because the crowds were too rowdy. Imagine that. Could you imagine the Celtics and the Warriors just say, hey, you know what, we're not even going to have a champion this year because the crowd is too crazy because the two teams that competed were like huge rivals. So European basketball, that's why it's so intriguing to me because – it's so different from the United States. All right, the last player that I want to talk about is a guy that I've been following closely for the last, sheesh, I want to say like four years, Adem Bona from Turkey. He is Nigerian. I lived in Turkey, I want to say 2016-17 season. So I am familiar with Turkey. And then there was a player that I was that I was friends with. He went to play for another team, and they had this young kid who was like 13 or 14 years old. Is, I mean, one, he's going to stand out in Turkey because he's Nigerian. You don't really see, I mean, on Turkey's junior teams, an African. But uh, so he stood out, but he is an explosive vertical athlete. He has the NBA vertical pop that I was saying that Vucevic doesn't have. Like he can sky from a standstill. He's a pick and roll threat. And the first time I saw him play, this was at the. Um, 2019 under 18s right and that tournament looking back at it was probably will probably go down as one of the best international tournaments as far as under 18s in years just along in that tournament you had Franz Wagner Alexis Pokashevsky uh um I think Musa Diabate drafted by the Clippers in there Ishmael Kamagate that was drafted by the Nuggets was in that tournament uh, Alperin Shingun, Usman Garuba, their, their teammates now, and then Santi Aldama. So all of those guys were drafted. And then there's some other guys that are could potentially be in this year's draft. So Bona was on that team, but he was a couple years younger. And at the time, he was just really raw. He was a guy that they couldn't really count on to play big minutes. But when he did come in, he made a lot of mistakes. 
but he showed flashes of athleticism, whether it was like, you know, a block or, you know, a tip dunk. But then he was just so new to the game and raw that he was actually a, a liability at the time. So over the past few years, he's moved to the States, played for a prolific prep. He's going to be a freshman or he is a freshman at UCLA. And he's someone that has potential to be a first round pick just because he's so explosive athletically. He is a, a rim protector, uh, has excellent, excellent timing as a shot blocker. He's not just your guy that is blocking shots because he's just tall and athletic. I mean, his timing is great. He blocks shots out of his area, if that makes sense. Um, very much so your typical high energy guy that has a great motor, runs the floor in transition, is a transition finisher. He shows some flashes of attacking on straight line drive. So when I watch this film, one of his favorite plays is weird because he, he, he likes to go to his left. It's like faking the dribble handoff, taking a couple dribbles, and then attacking the rim. That's, I mean, I've seen a couple plays. It's few and far between, but he does show he's added a little bit to his game. And then he can, every once in a while, exploit a mismatch in the post. It's not pretty. It's not pretty at all. It doesn't have a lot of feel and, and touch around the rim or post moves, but every once in a while. Now, the downside is is that outside of being a really good run and jump athlete that can defend, doesn't really have much else to his game. The ball handling isn't there. Doesn't really have a face-up game, not a face-up jumper. Doesn't space the floors. Very reluctant shooter. At one point, I started to feel like he hasn't really progressed over the years, which is still crazy because he could end up being a first-round pick. And he was really, really raw when I saw him in 2019. But I don't think he's added much to his game. He's still raw. He still is getting by just off this crazy athleticism and energy and shot blocking he is still turnover prone doesn't really pass out of double team so you know i saw like with the under 20 team at turkey they were trying to um trying to feed him in the post and he kind of struggled with reading double teams and making passes but the biggest area of concern for me is not that he doesn't have great touch around the rim it's not that he doesn't space the floor it's not that he whiffs on screens. He spends a lot of time on the floor. Like when I watched this film, I felt like every three or four plays, he was on the ground. So it makes me question his balance. Does he need to get stronger? But he is always on the floor. Now, he again, like I said, he's still raw. If he goes to UCLA, works on his balance, he doesn't even need to really like show case you know, extended shooting range or ball handling. If he can just impact games with his athleticism at UC, with his athleticism at UCLA, and he blocks a couple shots per game, and he's, you know, getting two or three offensive rebounds, and it's just making hustle plays, he has a chance to be a first round pick. Adem Bona from Turkey via Nigeria at UCLA. I think he has a chance to be a first round pick. We will see, but this is early, and these are just a few. I mean, there's so many more guys that I could that I could bring up, but just for a sake of time, these are the few guys that I think are from this international class that could have an impact on the 2023 NBA draft. Well, that wraps up this episode. It is now 1.19 a.m. I have a flight early in the morning. My schedule was crazy. Again, I mentioned... Um, Laws. I mentioned Paris, Amsterdam, basically 12 hours of traveling in 24 hours back to Paris, got a flight home. I'm home for maybe a day and a half. And then I am on my way to Las Vegas for the big matchup. It's like a big exhibition matchup, but between Victor Wimbanyama and Scoot Henderson, I will be there. I got my credentials. I am ready for, for that matchup. And uh, it's it should be good. Again, it should it's, it's something that I think is very, very creative that teams are teams and programs are finding a way to to get exposure for these for these prospects that are not playing in college basketball. So I think it's I think it's great, but I'll, I'll definitely be there. And again, shout out to everybody that has not only made the NBA Big World podcast your first listen of the day. Shout out to everybody that has subscribed to my newsletter. As an independent scout, it means a lot because the money that 
that I'm generating from subscriptions is, is going to my travels and allowing me to see these prospects firsthand, allowing me to be at the events where NBA scouts are at so I can talk to them. So I just I can't thank you guys enough. This year is going to be bigger and better. It's going to be bigger and better. So um, if you haven't subscribed, please subscribe. NBABigBoard.com. I'm getting quotes from NBA front office execs. I'm in the gym. I'm watching film. I'm I'm all over the place. But once again, it's Rafael Barlow. Thank you for tuning in. Hopefully, hopefully everybody had a good week. Thank you for making this your first listen of the day. But now, I suggest you make the second listen, the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast. Josh Lloyd is the number one daily fantasy basketball guru in the world. And his show is free. It's available wherever you get your podcast. That is Locked On Fantasy Basketball with Josh Lloyd. I got a plane to catch. I will see you on Monday. I'll see you on Monday. And then I'll I'll record it in Dallas. And then I guess I'll record on Tuesday from Las Vegas. Hopefully it's a good matchup. I'm out.